Good afternoon, everyone. We're ready to begin. So thank you all for coming to our event this evening. I'd like to welcome you to the signature event, actually, of the entire week of Moving Subjects, which is a week-long series of events, dance, lectures, student presentations, uh, sponsored by the Global Arts and Humanities Discovery Theme. My name is Wendy Hesford. I'm a professor of English and the faculty director for the Global Arts and Humanities. The Global Arts and Humanities is a university-wide project that facilitates cross-disciplinary research and creative practices about pressing global issues and concerns, including tonight's topic on refugee rights. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Theodora Dragostanova of History and also a faculty fellow in the Global Arts and Humanities. And take a, a thank you also, take time to thank everyone on the Migration, Mobility, and Immobility Project for their vision and commitment to this entire week. Additionally, I would like to thank our staff, program manager, Pooja Batra-Wells, taking photographs in the back, and Brianne Lejeune for her assistance in coordinating and documenting the events of this week. This summer, as the leadership team planned this event and the entire week, I was reminded of the critical role of testimony in documenting human rights violations and cultivating the compassion that drives social change. This was particularly true on July 10th, when the US House Oversight Committee on Civil Rights held a hearing on the treatment of migrant children separated from parents at the US-Mexico border. Yasmin Juarez, a Guatemalan citizen seeking asylum, was among the witnesses at this committee. Juarez told lawmakers about her young daughter's death after leaving an immigration and enforcement detention facility in Texas. Juarez's testimony bears witness to the unique circumstances of her daughter's death, but her testimony also evokes the history of separation of children of color from their families in the United States from children bought and sold under slavery to the Indian Removal Act in the 1800s, when Native American children were taken out of their homes and put into boarding schools, to children separated from parents in World War II Japanese internment camps, to the racial disparities in the incarceration of youth of color today. In other words, Juarez's testimony is not exceptional, but bears witness to American history and its legacies. While U.S. representatives continue to grapple with the human rights and humanitarian crisis at our border, we too should ask, what are our responsibilities in responding to such testimonies? How are we and how can we use cross-disciplinary perspectives to help us better understand these histories and their present formations? These questions about the crisis at the border are most directly related to this evening's keynote but they also underlie the focus of the global arts and humanities. The arts and humanities have played a vital role in the emergence of a diverse international human rights culture. The obstacles to human rights are significant, particularly refugee rights. But as history demonstrates, cultural forms of expression and persuasion precede legal developments. To think about the power of Juarez's testimony is to contemplate the dual role of national security and humanitarian efforts at the border. Global Arts and Humanities is pleased to support an event such as this that will bring these contradictions to light and to make visible the struggles and hopes of marginalized communities. Complex global problems require complex solutions that can only be transformative if they attend to a diversity of perspectives including the perspectives of those most affected by the crisis. So thank you again for joining us in this evening for what promises to be a very inspiring talk. And please join me in welcoming Professor Theodora Dragostanova, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy. And um, thank you very much for taking the time to thank Pooja Butterwells and Brianne Lejeune, who really put so much effort, both intellectually and logistically, uh, to put this event together. I also want to take a moment uh, to thank uh, my 
uh, team members, uh, the faculty members uh, in the Migration, Mobility and Immobility Project, Jana Hashamova from Slavic, Robin Judd from History, um, Ryan Skinner from African American and African Studies and the School of Music, Paloma Martinez Cruz from Spanish and Portuguese, Daniel Fosler Lucier from the School of Music. Thank you for your vision and for your support making this event and the entire week possible. Um, so I am a professor of history. I study modern European and Eastern European history. But in addition to that, I'm a few other things. I'm a native of Bulgaria. I was born and raised in what used to be communist Bulgaria. I'm a self-realized immigrant. 25 uh, years later, I have actually accepted the fact that now officially, I'm a first generation immigrant. And last but not, not least, I'm the mother of two Bulgarian American boys whom I hope to raise as citizens of the world. In short, these discussions about migration, mobility, and immobility that we have had during this entire week and we're going to continue having are also very personal to me because I believe that, yes, indeed, migration and mobility is one of the defining issues of our current times. Because I'm a historian, please allow me uh, to, uh, to please indulge me in a brief reflection on events that occurred some 30 years ago. Of course, I'm talking about 1989, the year of miracles, the miracle year, which marked the end of the Cold War in Europe and the collapse of the communist regimes in what used to be the Soviet bloc of Eastern Europe. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that 1989 was perhaps the most hopeful and optimistic year of the 20th century. When the world rejoiced the fall of political tyranny, the crumbling of walls, the tearing down of fences, the disappearance of watchtowers across Europe, and the emergence of societies based on ideas of freedom, including freedom of movement and freedom of opportunity. For my generation, the ability to travel, to study abroad, to seek opportunities in the world was deeply cherished, even if, didn't, if, even if it did not always turn out the way we envisioned it. Yet, 30 years later, and 30 years marks a generation, we live in a different world. A world of walled states, a world of militarized borders, a world of smart fences, technologically advanced installations meant to keep people out and away. A world of politicians unapologetically rejecting the values of open borders and freedom of movement while stoking nativist fears of alleged immigrant invasions, floods, and made up crisis. There's much to discuss here, but our focus today will be on the people caught up in these developments. The vulnerable, the desperate, the determined the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free. According to official estimates, more than 70 million people worldwide are formally classified as forcibly displaced persons. As people forced away from their homes for various reasons, be it war, political violence, environmental degradation, or economic desperation. And to, to address the predicament of people, people seeking refuge, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our keynote speaker, Becca Heller, who will speak to us on a timely topic, refugee rights at a crossroads. So I'm going to take a minute to introduce our speaker. Becca Heller is the executive director and co-founder of the International Refugee Assistance Project and a visiting clinical lecturer in law at Yale uh, Law School. Becker received a bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College and her JD from Yale uh, Law School. She also spent a year living in Malawi as a Fulbright Scholar. During her second year in law school, in, she co-founded the International Refugee Assistance Project to address the unmet legal needs of refugees seeking resettlement to a safe country. Um, and uh, Becker has received numerous awards in recognition of her work with IRAP, including the MacArthur Genius Award um, fellowship just last uh, year. Following her presentation, we are going to have Professor Hassan Jeffries from the History Department moderate a uh, 
question and answer session and we have placed uh, some paper in each table on each table so if you want to uh, write down any questions as you're listening to our presenter please do and we are going to collect those and uh, present them to Hassan I'm just going to take a second to introduce Hassan this way we don't interrupt the flow of the conversation um, Hassan Jeffries uh, is an associate professor of history at the Ohio State University, where he teaches courses on African-American history, the civil rights movement, and the history of race and racism in America from slavery through the present. He graduated from Morehouse College uh, with a BA in history and earned his PhD from Duke University. And in addition to his research on African-American freedom movement and the black experience, in the post-Civil uh, War era, Hassan also has been deeply involved in various public history projects. Most recently, he's hosting the podcast Teaching Heart History, American Slavery, a production of the Southern Poverty Law Center's Teaching Tolerance Project. Uh, so join me, please, in welcoming our keynote speaker, Becca Heller, who is going to speak to us on refugee rights at the crossroads. speak next to a picture of yourself, especially when it was like 15 pounds ago. Uh, thank you so much to Ohio State University and in particular to the Migration, Mobility and Immobility Project for having me here and hosting this important week of events. Um, I should admit from the get-go that I, my mother went to the University of Michigan and my husband went to the University of Michigan and a weirdly disproportionate number of people on my staff went to the University of Michigan and when they saw on my calendar that I was speaking here there was like some consternation so then I was like well what you know if I want to sass the crowd a little bit what can we say and the universal answer was that Michigan's football team is doing so poorly against OSU that I just shouldn't mention it at all um, so that's where we landed um, the other uh, thing that I struggled with dialectically a little bit about this talk was that in, in speaking with Theodora, um, I had originally proposed a, a slightly different title for the talk, and I was asked to not make it political. Um, and, and I think that's a, that's a little bit of a false dichotomy, because the, the history of the refugee at, of program in the US, it was, it, the, the act itself was passed in 1980 that created US RAP, or the US Refugee Admissions Program. It was signed by, Ronald Reagan. The reason that Congress stepped in to legislate it about it at all wasn't because it was controversial whether or not we would take in refugees. It was just controversial whether or not the executive branch or the legislative branch would decide who and how many. So when the program in its current form was created, there was, it, it was assumed to be implicit to US foreign policy that taking in people seeking refuge from other countries, and at the time, of course, a lot of them were communist bloc countries, was in the best interest of the United States and in the best interest of the world order. There was not any discussion about that. If you look at the legislative history of the program, all of the debate was about whether the president should have control or whether Congress should have control. And at the end of the day, it, it was viewed as sort of so inherent to proper US foreign policy and to humanitarian aid to have a refugee program that the act suggested a mandatory minimum of 50,000 refugees a year for the first three years that it was in place. And we actually exceeded that every single year. And since 1980, with the exception of 2001, because there was a freeze on the refugee program following 9-11, not because there were specific ties between Al-Qaeda and the towers falling to refugees, but because we froze all immigration to redo the security checks writ large, we've taken in on average 90,000 refugees per year, regardless of who controlled Congress or who controlled the Oval Office. I feel that the refugee issue today has been deliberately politicized by anti-refugee politicians who are like seeking to turn immigrants and refugees into scapegoats for political gain. And I think that speaking out about that should not constitute a partisan or political act. It's a statement about what are the fundamental democratic values of our country, what our human rights obligations are. And up until about three years ago, it was not considered partisan to say that we think that refugees should be able to come in or we don't think that people from predominantly Muslim countries should be subjected to a travel ban. Um, so with that disclaimer, what I say is probably going to come off as pretty political, um, but I refuse to accept responsibility for that. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm just going to rely on my own experience and tell you what I've experienced and you're free to accept or reject whatever bits of it you want to accept or reject because uh, last I checked Twitter, the First Amendment still exists in this country. <laughs> um, so I was first sort of exposed to refugee issues between my first and second year in law school. It was August of 2008. I was doing an internship at an NGO in Tel Aviv. Um, and the upshot of which was that uh, I didn't really have anything to do there, um, in part because they hadn't organized well for interns, which has now become like an OCD pet peeve of mine whenever we host interns of just like, let's not, you know, the fact that they're free doesn't mean that they should just like sit there and like read Facebook all day. Um, but also because it turns out that in Israel, the law is practiced in Hebrew and I didn't speak Hebrew and I didn't manage to figure that out before I went. Uh, <laughs> So, I, which I used to blame Yale Law School for and I kind of can't anymore. Um, so I was sitting in this air conditioned office in Tel Aviv watching Mad Men, uh, but it was only season two and there aren't that many episodes per season, so I ran out of episodes and then I'm like, well now what? Um, and I, the way that I ingested news at the time and still do, and I suspect the way that many of you ingest news is I sort of like wake up in the morning and I like pull over my phone and I have the, you know, eight different websites that I go to and I read all the headlines. And then if Kim Kardashian's had another baby, I read the whole article. Um, so I felt like I had like a pretty broad understanding of what was happening in the world, if not a deep understanding. And, and somehow I hadn't heard at all about this refugee crisis that the US had created in Iraq. Um, and I feel pretty comfortable saying the US created it. I was, I was like, is that political? And I was like, it doesn't matter, it's a fact. Um, we still have facts. Uh, and so I'm, I'm sitting in Israel and I keep hearing about these million Iraqi refugees in Jordan who can't go back to Iraq because something really horrible happened to them there or will happen to them if they return. They can't stay in Jordan because Jordan is not a signatory to the UN Convention on the Status of Refugees, so they have no rights. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. And I felt like as an American, how, how had I not heard about this at all, um, in spite of my like obsessive reading of most of the internet every morning. And so I decided that um, I was going to quit my silly internship and go to Jordan and just try to meet with some families of Iraqi refugees, um, sort of to, in my own head I think I was sort of like fulfilling my obligation as a US citizen to understand the humanitarian fallout of my country's foreign policy. I will say that in looking back at that now, I really cringe at that decision because it feels an awful lot like social justice warrior poverty tourism, right? You have like this overprivileged white girl like sitting in this NGO in Israel while her Ivy League law school like pays for her to do nothing essentially um, and then being like, I'm gonna go meet some oppressed people in Jordan. And so while I'm not like super proud of that, it is what happened. Um, so when I tell the origin story, I tell it and then I also try to just self call because I think that like just going to try to experience human suffering is like not the best play to make. Um, but that's what I did. Uh, and I emailed sort of everyone who I could think of and through a very attenuated series of people, I managed to go to Jordan and to meet with six Iraqi families. And I, I had spent a couple years um, between college and law school working on sort of like humanitarian aid issues in sub-Saharan Africa. So I was expecting what I would consider sort of your standard humanitarian problems like food insecurity, lack of access to education, lack of access to meaningful health care. Um, those things were all present. But what really surprised me is that every single family independently identified their primary problem to me as essentially a legal one. Um, which Do any of you guys know the song Closing Time by Semisonic? <laughs> oh god, I was worried that everyone in this room was either going to be too young or too old. So, so I actually happen to think that all of refugee law and politics can be summed up by the chorus to that song, which is, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Um, and that's, that's really most countries' attitudes towards refugees, and it was, it's Jordan's attitude to both to Iraqis then and now. Syrians as well, which is like, well, we're not going to deport you, but we're going to make it really, really miserable if you try to stay. And that's to say nothing if you are, say, a religious minority, an LGBTI individual, a single woman who's at risk or has kids. Um, all of these people are sort of uniquely vulnerable to ongoing violence in Jordan. Um, there was actually, um, I think, North African populations of refugees in particular have a really bad time in Amman. There was a series of lynchings of Sudanese refugees there that didn't get any 
coverage in the media whatsoever. Um, so even sort of absent the legal status question, there are genuine acute safety issues for refugees in many of the, the first places they flee, which we call your country of first asylum, um, which is not necessarily your destination country. It's just the first place you can get to. And uh, so I met all these families and, and their only option they felt like was to get to another country because it wasn't working out for them in Jordan. But the international system that exists to both select who gets to go to sort of third de destination countries and then process them um, didn't make any sense to anybody. And everyone had been waiting for years and years and also everyone thought that they were on some kind of a wait list. Um, and if they just sort of hung in there long enough, eventually they would get a call from say the Canadian government or the Australian government or the US government saying, hey, congratulations, your name came up on the list, you can get on a plane and fly to Toronto and start your life over. And at the end of the week, uh, I was chagrined to say the least. And I thought that at least I could try to understand sort of how does this program work and how long is the wait list? Because I think, you know, there's this myth about refugees, and I'm gonna get a little more into this, that they're these sort of like passive victims. Um, and, and I think it's really quite the opposite is true because a refugee is by definition someone who went through something really messed up and got themselves out. Right? Every single one of them sort of self-selected to what we call vote with their feet to, to get themselves to another place. And I found it um, problematic, if not offensive, that information was being deliberately withheld from refugees about kind of how this resettlement process worked, what on earth the UN was doing, what the embassies were doing, and how long they might need to wait. And I thought at the very least I could get back to them and say, okay, it's six months, it's a year, it's two years, whatever it is, I want you to be empowered with this information because you can make a plan and you're empirically quite good at planning because you've gotten this far, which was not easy. Um, and so I, <laughs> I ended up faking an issue with my passport because the only way to get a live person on the phone at the US Embassy was to call Consular Citizen Services. And I went into the embassy for a meeting and I said, you know, I'm a law student, I'm interested in this like refugee gig that you guys have going on. They hooked me up with someone from Public Affairs and someone from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. They spent a long time explaining how resettlement works for me. At the time, it didn't make any sense. I thought it was because I didn't understand it, and in retrospect, it's because the system itself is totally nonsensical. Um, a refugee, for example, trying to come to the US has to go through a minimum of four interviews. You have to turn in dozens and dozens of pages of documents. They have to be in English. Uh, you often need to provide identity documents that don't exist, that your country doesn't issue, or that would get you killed if you went to the embassy to try to request them. The interviews can be anywhere from one to seven hours long. They often take place through panes of bulletproof glass and through multiple interpreters. And then at the end, someone looks at your case and looks at all of this information and looks at this sort of archaic legal standard that hasn't been updated since 1951, which I'll talk about, and, and makes a decision basically that determines kind of whether you're going to live or die in a very literal way. Um, and yet the things that we would normally associate with a fair adjudication or a fair trial in this country are not present. There's no appeal. You're actually banned from having a lawyer present with you at your interview. Um, and there's no kind of review mechanism. Not only is there not a formal appeal, but there's no one going back and checking like, hey, we said that Becca couldn't come in. Was that right? Like, are, are we really sure? Um, and it, it just ends up that it creates a system that's very discretionary and arbitrary and has no real recourse if you get wronged. But for the people who are wronged by the system or even who just don't know how to navigate a bureaucracy, which let's face it is most of us, like I don't, I, how many people are overpaying their cable bill right now? Like that's an example of like an unnavigable bureaucracy and I'd rather be doing that than trying to work with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. But, but their lives are literally on the line and at the end of this conversation with the embassy officials, I was like, okay, I kind of get it. I mostly don't, but it, you know, what, what's the deal with this wait list? And they said, what wait list? <laughs> like, we don't have a wait list. It's just like a file gets referred or it doesn't. And at first I was really angry and I thought the wait list was some kind of like nefariously propagated rumor to try to placate people, right? Because there are instances where um, displaced people will protest outside the UN or they'll rally in camps because they have no other way to sort of take back control of their own rights than by sort of traditional forms of protest and popular uprising. Um, they have not turned violent notably, um, 
but just absent any other information, I think that's what people are left to do. And I thought that sort of not telling people about the wait list was just another way to try to kind of pacify them by divorcing them from access to information about their rights. Upon reflection and talking to a lot of people about it, I feel quite confident that the rumor about the waitlist actually came from within the refugee community itself. I think because if you live at the bottom of a deep, dark hole, in order to get out of bed every morning, you have to believe that there's some kind of light at the top of the hole. You can't just exist in this permanent state of limbo. And so I think people sort of created this almost like metaphorical way out or a metaphorical end to the waiting. And the fact that the best symbol of hope that the community could sort of collectively come up with was a wait list, which to me is a symbol of a dysfunctional bureaucracy, because otherwise there ostensibly wouldn't be a wait list, struck me as so problematic that I wanted to see if I could do something about it. So I went back to school, because I was still pretending to do that, and uh, myself and a couple of other students started trying to work on some of these cases. And it was a pretty interesting mix of students. There was one who um, had served in the US military and had interpreters that he was trying to get out. There was no another who had been a reporter for the Washington Post. Um, and there was a special program that said if your life is in danger because you worked for a US media organization, you're supposed to get sort of expedited for processing. Um, and neither of them could figure out, th these are like very smart, one of them's like a Rhodes Scholar, not that that is necessarily an indicator of intelligence, but they have all the hallmarks of being smart people. They're at Yale Law School, they're native English speakers, they have internet access, and they can't figure out how to navigate these applications for these people that they're trying to get out. So, we came together and we said, okay, we're gonna start this group. We called it the Iraqi Refugee Assistance Project because we were not very creative about naming things. Um, I wanna tell like a briefly diversionary anecdote uh, for the students in the audience. So um, obviously, as you can tell from the story, I knew nothing about this going into the project. I didn't know anything about refugees. I didn't know anything about the Middle East. I knew almost nothing about human rights. And I was working with this set of people who were like incredibly intimidating, most notably um, this one guy who's now the chair of our board, John Finer, who was the Washington Post reporter, the Rhodes Scholar. He had like been embedded with the US military in Iraq for multiple years. He had reported from the um, tunnels where they like smuggle things out of Gaza. And I was, I was really afraid of him, honestly. Because um, I just felt like I didn't have any value add. I was just like, what am I going to bring to this effort other than that I sort of wandered into this problem for six days before like flying to Turkey for eight days of a vacation? Because Turkey used to be a place where you do that. Um, was that political? No, <laughs> uh, and and I, I just felt like I, I didn't really have much to offer, but I really wanted to help. And then... Um, when you, I'm sure many people here have started a student organization, I think it's fairly universal that when you start a student organization, kind of like, the, you know, you register with the school in whatever process, and there's some kind of activities fair, and there's like a folding table, and then you try to get people to volunteer. So I was talking to Finer, and I was like, okay, how about like, you make the poster, and I'll make the sign-up sheet, and we'll like meet at our folding table tomorrow. And he was like, well, how do you make a poster? And I was like, just get a piece of poster board, right, Iraqi Refugee Assistance Project on it. And then I was like, do you have some photos of like when you were in Iraq? He's like, yeah, I was like, great. Put those around it on the poster. And he was like, okay. So we come back the next day and he has just like the crappiest <laughs> poster I've ever seen. First of all, it says IRAP, so no one knows what that is. It doesn't like spell out what the thing is. And then it's like at the bottom, there's just these three really sad little photos like in a row in like the bottom right corner. And it was, it was this really incredible moment for me of just like, I have value add. <laughs> like, I'm not a Rhodes Scholar, and I've never tried to like smuggle anything from a tunnel in Gaza, and I know nothing about the Middle East, but I do know how to make a poster for a student activities fair. And, <laughs> and I always like to mention that, especially when I talk to students, because I think a lot of things seem really hopeless, and they're complicated, and they're massive. You know, we throw around numbers like 70 million that it's easy to get really discouraged and think that there's not anything that you can do. And I am literally standing here today in large part because I knew how to make a sign-up sheet at a student activities <laughs> fair. And so they like kept me around for this project. Um, so just like don't underestimate just literally like what you can do by just like wanting to do something and being willing to pursue it. Because that's about twice as far as anyone else ever gets.
John doesn't like that I tell that story. <laughs> but it's important. He, he went on to like run the State Department. His, his ego is fine. Um, so, so we sort of get going. And then about like four weeks into doing this, uh, my mentor and our supervising professor, Mike Wishney, calls us into his office. And he's like, so this refugee thing you guys are doing? And we're like, yes. And he's like, you're not actually working on cases, are you? And we were pretty dumb, but not super dumb. So we were kind of like, oh, Mike, what an interesting question. Like, why do you ask? And he said, because that's illegal, because you're not lawyers. And we call that the unauthorized practice of law. Um, which, footnote, the, <laughs> the fact that the practice of law is restricted to people who pay a bunch of money to go to law school and then pass an arbitrary bar exam that bears no actual relation either to law school or the practice of law is simply a way to use language to alienate people from accessing their basic rights. And footnote. So we're like, well, we really want to help these people. And it seems a little arbitrary that we can't do it because we're not lawyers. But surely we can find some lawyers. So we like went out in the hall and we're like, OK, where do we get lawyers? Um, and then we thought, well, these law firms come here and recruit all the time. Why don't we just call them up and say, like, hey, do you want to try to like impress some students here? Why don't you agree to supervise us on these cases? So law firms started getting involved. Um, my best friend from college, who actually uh, she passed away two months ago, um, Sally Newman, was just a complete badass activist. Um, she was at NYU Law at the time, and I was talking to her about what we were doing, and she was like, that's cool. I want to organize some students here to do it. So then we had another chapter at NYU. And then some kids at Berkeley found out about it. I don't even know how and contacted us. And um, by the following summer, we had nine chapters throughout the country. I'm really obsessed with efficiency, footnotes and asides aside. Uh, and I wasn't really interested in starting an organization. And frankly, I'm still not. Uh, and if you're thinking about it, I would advise you against it, because all you do is ask for money all of the time, and everyone else gets to do the interesting stuff. Go work for someone else's organization and do the programming, um, unless you like fundraising, in which case we could talk about that too. I, so our first move was to say, it seems obvious that oh, every time I breathe, it like gets amplified in this really gross way, sorry. Um, <laughs> It seems obvious to us that refugees going through this process ought to have legal representation. Um, in the, I think people conflate the words refugee and asylum seeker. The, an asylum seeker is someone who's already in a country and trying to stay. So if you're seeking asylum in the US, you're already here. And you're saying, you can't deport me because wherever you send me back to, something really bad is going to happen to me. That's like a slight oversimplification, but that's the gist. A refugee seeking resettlement is outside of a country and trying to get in. In the context of asylum seekers, so folks already in the US for whom representation is permissible, although not provided, there have been multiple studies, including by our own federal government, that have found that all other variables aside, having a lawyer alone makes you 400% more likely to be granted asylum. And that's in a system, and while I'm not going to defend the sort of due process rights in the asylum system, because they're indefensible and kind of pathetic, there are some due process rights in the asylum process, and there are none for refugees. And so you can only imagine, if someone were to do a study, what the impact could potentially be of the provision of legal assistance in terms of whether you get a favorable decision or not, and on which your life quite literally depends. So it seemed obvious to me that someone at some point had said, oh, there should be legal aid for refugees the same way there's legal aid for asylum seekers or legal aid for you know, people in other um, civil trials in the US. And so we spent the first year just sort of calling around and trying to figure out like who else was doing this, who we could just volunteer with. And we hadn't been able to find anyone. And then my 2L summer, I was interning at the New York Legal Aid Society. And I was, uh, that was a more productive internship. And it was in English, so that was helpful for me, because um, English is my language. Uh, and I'm sitting in this cube with like 87 other interns. Um, and I get a call on my cell phone. And you know how like different sort of subcultures have their own celebrities? So like whatever weird hobby you have, you probably know the people who are the best at that. Um, in the refugee subculture, there's a guy named Vincent Cochetel, uh, who at the time was the head of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees for North America, um, and who gave a TED Talk that, that you should, I really hate TED Talks actually. Um, this is going to go out and record, and now I'll never get to give one, but that's fine. Uh, I'll stand by that. Um, 
he, but he gave an amazing TED Talk. He was actually held hostage in Chechnya for 180 days. And his TED Talk was on what do you put in your head to not lose your mind while you're being held hostage for 180 days. He's, he's like a legend. And he somehow got my cell phone number, which at the time was a total mystery to me. And now I think I know how it happened, but I'm still not sure. And I picked up the phone and he you know, introduced himself. And I pretended like uh, I wasn't fangirling. And then he said, you know, at the UN, we've heard that you guys are providing legal representation for some of these refugee cases. And we have a lot of cases that we refer to the US and the US rejects. And we think that they're being rejected unfairly, but there's nothing we could do. Is there any chance that you guys could start doing appeals for them? And I had this just like completely bifurcated reaction of on the one hand, like, oh my gosh, like Vince Cochatel is calling me and asking me to do this. And on the other hand, like, oh my gosh, like Vince Cochatel is calling me and asking me to do, like you don't have another phone call you can make Vince Cochatel. Um, and, and that was when I sort of realized that just like no one had tried to do this before. Uh, which, and I don't have time to get into it in my talk, but my theory of why that is, is the internet. Uh, which you're free to ask a question about if that seems interesting to you. Um, so that was sort of the moment that in my head I, I pulled the trigger and decided that um, instead of being an immigration line lawyer at the New York Legal Aid Society, I was going to try to start doing this thing full time. Um, and we've, we've built it into a, a pretty good organization since then. Um, and if you fast forward to, let's pick a random non-political date, November 9th, uh, 2016. <laughs> IREP at that time had 30 chapters at law schools in the US and Canada. We're partnered with over 120 law firms, also in-house counsels from multinational corporations who have started feeling pressure to do pro bono or volunteer work, which is great and we want to encourage. Um, working on cases, advocating for refugees, um, and then someone gets elected to be president on a platform that says that Syrian refugees shouldn't be able to come into the country. And we spent three months sort of brainstorming like, okay, there is some kind of existential threat to refugees and immigrants. Um, what do we have to deploy against that? And the answer that we kept coming back to, uh, which is not a popular answer, was a bunch of lawyers. Um, so we started trying to, you know, what can we do with a bunch of lawyers? And we thought we would have a little bit more time to figure it out. Um, but Trump was sworn in on Friday, January 20th. He spent the weekend golfing, which I say in a completely nonpartisan way because people on both sides of the aisle golf. And on Monday, a version of the Muslim ban was leaked to us. Um, we were sent a photograph of a desktop computer monitor in the White House with a text of what eventually became the Muslim ban on it. And it had all of the things that we were very afraid it would have. The draft actually had an explicit preference for Christian refugees. That got edited out um, over the course of the week. But the other things in it, like banning Syrian refugees and banning travelers from, at the time it was seven predominantly Muslim countries, uh, eventually became the law. And we were like, they did not waste any time. It was literally the first day in office. And so um, a lot of our clients had permission to travel, um, but hadn't departed yet. Because it's actually like pretty difficult to leave the place where your family has been living for say 3,000 years. Um, right, you have to sell everything you own. You're trying to liquidate all your assets. People like want their kids to finish school. If you want to, you know, tie things up at your job, like people are living real lives. Um, they get very disrupted by having to abandon your your um, country of origin forever, and it sometimes takes a minute to like get it all together. But but so we had about 40 clients who were in this position where they had permission to travel, but they hadn't left yet. And we called all of them and we were just like, get on a plane. The, you know, the doors to the US are closing. We don't know when they're closing. Once they close, we don't know if they're gonna open again. So if you wanna sort of use the fact that you've won this lottery to get refugee status and come here, you need to get on a plane. And we got law firms to donate the money for it. Um, on Tuesday, uh, we had a transgender client who was traveling from a Middle Eastern country to LAX. Oh, sorry, to the, that's the airport in Los Angeles. I fly around a lot, so the codes become like real words to me, even though they're actually um, jargon dragons. And when we have trans, we have a lot of trans clients, because the way that we try to pick clients is to look for sort of like who's the most vulnerable, um, and transgender people in the Middle East and North Africa region are really vulnerable. So this happens to us a fair amount, and um, a consistent problem is that your papers don't match your identity, right? Because if I'm 
born and uh, they say like, you're a girl and you're Becca Heller and here's your birth certificate. And then when I'm like 13 or 17 or 45 or whatever, I realize like, I am not a girl named Becca. I am a man and my name is John. I can't go to the Saudi Arabian government and say like, hey, actually I've realized that like I'm a different gender. Can you please give me a different passport? Because they will literally put me in jail and kill me. So we worry a lot about like exiting, right? Because when you exit an airport and you show a passport that's and like you're, I'm standing here as a man named John and then I'm handing you a passport that says I'm a woman named Becca, um, it can potentially get you in trouble. In this case, we were really worried about what would happen to her when she landed in LA because we were like, is, is Customs and Border Protection just looking for any excuse to repel refugees from the Middle East? If this travel ban comes down while she's in the air, what happens to her? Um, is she gonna get like prosecuted for having fraudulent documents? So we thought, okay, we're just gonna have a lawyer go kind of hang out in the arrivals area of LAX. They'll be talking to each other on WhatsApp and we'll make sure that she gets through the process smoothly. Um, and she did, which was great. Thank you, Customs and Border Protection at LAX. Uh, that night at like 11.30, I was G-chatting with my policy director um, Betsy Fisher, who notably is from Ohio but went to Michigan, sorry. And, uh, and she was like, oh, I'm so glad that the ban didn't come down today. And I said, um, oh, why? Because this woman was able to get on a plane. And Betsy was like, well, not just, not just this woman, but everyone else who was on that plane. And I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, well, refugees travel in groups. They're, they're out processing as like 60 or 70 people at a time. And so had the ban come down, presumably everyone on this flight would have had an issue getting in. And then we both sort of simultaneously realized, and when you, I've looked back at this transcript, because I sort of can't believe it happened, we both sound drunk, uh, although we're, total, we're not. Um, it's just late and we don't know what to do. Uh, but we, we sort of simultaneously realized that at any given point, whenever this thing gets signed, there's gonna be thousands of people who mid-air become inadmissible to the United States, right? People who, when they took off from wherever they were taking off from, had valid permission to enter on a tourist visa or a student visa or as refugees or whatever else because this ban applied to everybody. And they're gonna land as undocumented immigrants and nobody knows what's gonna happen to them. And so we put out a call for lawyers to go to airports around the country. Um, and a, a thing that I don't talk about that much that I want to mention is that, so we made, a, you know, the sort of politics between different organizations is stupidly complicated. Um, and I say stupidly because it's just like, it's very frustrating to me when the movement suffers because people are fighting over things like credit or like whose logo goes, you know, at the top left or whatever. Um, and we were trying to tread really lightly with this because we're not a resettlement organization. Uh, you know, we do a lot of stuff when people are still over there, but once they get over here, there's a whole other set of infrastructure that's designed to support people and is um, mildly successful at doing that. And so we had made a round of calls basically at like midnight being like, hey, are you cool with this? Are you cool with this? Great, okay. Um, put out the call for lawyers and then I got a flood of phone calls the next day from people from other NGOs saying that we needed to stand down. Um, essentially that if we had all these lawyers go to airports, we were gonna provoke the government into clamping down on arriving people and that allegedly the administration had sworn that there would be a grace period after the ban went into effect and that for some period of time after the grace period, anyone who had a valid visa could come in. So I had this just like another sort of weirdly schizophrenic moment of like, you know, this seems very unlikely to me that there will be a grace period or that they're even like organized enough to implement one. At the same time, everyone who is both older than me, probably wiser than me, and is doing this for a lot longer says that like, if we go ahead with this action, we're gonna provoke a really bad consequence. Like, I don't want my own hubris to be the reason that like the travel ban messes up the lives of a bunch of people. So what we ended up doing was sort of sending an email to these 1,600 lawyers who had signed up and saying like, you know, we're full, uh, but please stand by. And then we secretly just had two lawyers go to every airport. And we were monitoring what happened to our clients. Um, one of our clients was a man named Hamid Darwish. He had worked for 10 and a half years uh, as an interpreter for the US military in Iraq. Um, he had been shot at a number of times. He, had, he was traveling with his wife and two little kids. 
He had waited years and years for the special visa that Congress had promised him. Um, one of the fun things about working on a Ford operating base, which Hamid did, is that every six months you have to get a military grade level security check, which means that Hamid, by the time he got on a plane, I actually don't remember if he had a stop, but roughly from Baghdad to JFK, uh, had had 21 military grade level security checks that had found that he was not remotely a threat. When he landed at JFK on Friday, January 27th, he landed three hours after President Trump signed the Muslim ban, which was at about 4.30, and he was shackled to a table, uh, handcuffed, told that he was a national security threat, and then detained. They let out his wife and kid who met our lawyer in the hallway of JFK. They were sobbing. They had been told by Customs and Border Protection that they could come out and see the lawyer, but then they had to go back. Um, we instead put them in a taxi and sent them to a hotel because it's actually not legal to tell someone that they have to return to CBP. Um, and then, but we asked them first, you know, the room where Hamid was put, like, was he the only one there? And they said, no, there's easily like 20, 30, or 40 people in there. They're all handcuffed. And we were like, send up the bat signal. So we put out a call and lawyers from all over the country flooded the airports. The other thing that we did was, um, put together a lawsuit with um, the ACLU, the National Immigration Law Center, and Yale Law School um, saying, you cannot detain people at airports under this unconstitutional law. You cannot turn airport holding facilities into black sites where people are detained indefinitely without access to due process. There's something called the writ of habeas corpus. Um, and I did a bunch of like news interviews the following week and um, made myself really unpopular by like talking about this a lot, which is not a fun talking point, but it is really, really important to pretty much like every fundamental freedom in the US. The government cannot hold you without giving you access to some kind of trial. It doesn't matter who you are. You can be like a terrorist suspect in Gitmo. You still have some procedural rights under the writ of habeas corpus, which translates literally into produce the body, right? You can't lock up the body in the back of the airport and just like leave it there. So we ended up filing a class action writ of habeas corpus on behalf of anyone detained in the entire country under the travel ban. We stayed up all night to put it together because we wanted to get it filed by five o'clock in the morning before any international flights could take off because we didn't want anyone to be deported. We got a hearing in Brooklyn that night at 7.30 and at 8.30 we won uh, and found out later through, by suing under the Freedom of Information Act that 2,100 people had been imprisoned at airports under the ban for no reason at all and then were let go because of our victory in the lawsuit. I paused to take a breath and then it felt like I was like fishing for applause and so I feel <laughs> weird about it. Um, I, I, think, I think a lot of things about airport weekend. Uh, one thing I wanna flag is that in the end, we lost. Um, I get asked this question a lot, like, well, what's happening with the Muslim ban now? And the answer is, there is a Muslim ban. The Supreme Court has held that it is constitutional to have a ban on people from now, it's like nine countries, but it's basically six, because in Venezuela, it like, only applies to like a handful of government officials, and in North Korea, we don't really admit anyone from there anyway. But basically, millions and millions of mostly Muslim people every year cannot come to the US under this ban, and the Supreme Court held that it was well within the authority of the president to do this, even if it was for suspect, possibly racial or religious discriminatory reasons, as long as the text of the ban itself didn't say anything overtly discriminatory. Um, so even though he tweeted stuff like, this is a Muslim ban, uh, and things about how people should be shot with bullets dipped in pork's blood, the Supreme Court decided that those tweets weren't relevant as long as the text itself didn't self-describe as a Muslim ban. I will note that it took them three tries to write a version of it that passed constitutional muster, but that it is in place and it's active today and it is screwing a lot of people, including, for example, Syrian refugee students who got into Harvard and MIT. This is a real example. There was, there's a special program for Syrian refugees to get scholarships to like super fancy pants schools. Um, and none of them got their visas this year. There had to be a series of news stories about it. They had to petition. 
Um, we are using any excuse that we can to keep people out of the country for um, no real apparent reason because it's pretty universally accepted that it is really hurting our economy to do this. I want to talk about a couple of myths about refugees. I think there are sort of two dominant narratives of refugees and they both suck. Uh, one is a narrative on the left which says that refugees are victims um, and they're really helpless and we need to help them because we have an obligation as like a resource rich country to take pity on people. Um, I think that often gets intertwined with some religious elements. A lot of the agencies in the US that resettle refugees are um, explicitly part of large religions. So you get some of that sprinkled in there as well. Um, then I think there's this narrative uh, on the far right that refugees are terrorists and they're trying to kill all of us. Um, I won't engage that too much except to say that a study by the Cato Institute, which is pretty conservative libertarian, found that statistically you are more likely to get struck by lightning twice than you are to suffer violence at the hands of a refugee. Uh, and in fact, you're seven times more likely to be hurt by a white US born terrorist than you are by a foreign born terrorist, um, which suggests to me that we should probably just deport all of ourselves um, and then we'll have a much safer country and indigenous people can reclaim their land and everything will be fine. The, the reason that I find problems with, with both of these narratives is that they're, they're sort of wild oversimplifications, right? If you're looking at any group of 70 million people, there's very little you can say that universally applies to all of them. Um, I think there have been some attempts to sort of humanize refugees. Does anyone read Us Weekly? But you know celebrities, they're just like us. It's like, oh look, JLo goes to the gas station. It's like, no she doesn't, that's a post photo. Um, but there's this sort of like refugees, they're just like us campaign. And I think that that's also doing a disservice to refugees because while they, we have many things in common with refugees, none of us have been, or maybe some of you in this room have, but you're refugees, persecuted, forced to leave our homeland, flee and start our lives totally over in another place. So like while refugees also get gas and send their kids to school and make jokes at the dinner table, I don't think it's quite accurate to say like, oh, we're all the same, right? It's also not accurate to say that there are victims because refugees, as I mentioned earlier, are by definition survivors. These are the people who got out. The US claims that what we're looking for in our sort of economic growth and our, our national ethos is entrepreneurs, right? The sort of like Silicon Valley tech startup, the fact that like manufacturing is wiping out jobs and we need to find them in the innovation space. We need people who are creative and entrepreneurial and innovative and undeterred by huge forces they can't control. And I would suggest that in light of this, we really ought to be competing with other countries for refugees because there is nothing more tenacious and entrepreneurial than getting your entire family out of Islamic State occupied Mosul, escaping across the border to Jordan, navigating this crazy resettlement process, coming to the US and starting your life completely over. Refugees are, to me, sort of the epitome of what we want it to mean to be American. Um, another myth is that refugees and immigrants are detrimental to the economy. Um, there have been a huge number of studies proving this isn't true. There was a specific study showing that Ohio and the Rust Belt in particular have been hit really hard by the travel ban because y'all can't get enough nurses and doctors. Um, there are a lot of sort of sector by sector analysis of who's been hit the hardest by these sort of draconian immigration policies that um, have come out of this non-political administration. Um, my favorite study is actually from the Trump administration itself. Um, so as part of the second iteration of the Muslim ban, they ordered themselves to do a study on the economic cost of refugee admissions to the US. And the assumption was that they discover that it was costing the US lots of money and that that would become a great talking point for why we shouldn't admit any refugees. Their own study found that over a 10 year period, refugees netted $64 billion to the US economy, uh, largely through being uh, productive employees and paying taxes. They then tried to suppress the study, which someone leaked to the Wall Street Journal and later came out in the New York Times. Um, so even the most biased of researchers has found that refugees net money to the US economy on the order of tens of billions of dollars, uh, which PS is 12 times the cost of a border wall, just in case anyone's keeping track at home. I think that, you know, obviously refugee rights are at a crossroads. Um, we, the refugee number for this year, remember how I talked about it was an average of 90,000 for every year since 1980? This year the number is 18,000. 
Um, it is the lowest it has ever been. Uh, last year it was 30,000, and the year before that it was 45,000. Um, I do not think that this is a result of partisanship, as I discussed. I do think it's something that we really actively need to resist. I think that not admitting refugees into this country is not only bad for our national ethos, for our values, and for our economics, but it's really bad for our national security. I think that what's happening in Turkey and Syria now is a pretty perfect example of what happens when you abandon your allies and how then you won't really have any allies anymore. Um, and that's something we're, we're going to be increasingly facing. And so right now we're engaged in some advocacy around saying, you know, if, if these senators are serious, and senators from both parties, right, are serious that we want to protect the lives of our Kurdish allies and the U.S. isn't going to be able to enforce this fake ceasefire, at the very least we should be admitting them through the refugee program or through some kind of special visa program. So hopefully you'll see more on that in the coming days, possibly in this sanctions bill. Um, but, but what can you do, right? It, it's hard to have hope um, in, in the face of such an onslaught of bad news, at least in the immigration and refugee space. Um, and I think we're also all pretty tired. Uh, I know I'm really tired. And so when you hear a number like 70 million and, and you think of a place like Syria or Turkey, which seems really far away, how can you battle that hopelessness and exhaustion and actually do something? Um, so, Ohio, it turns out, you guys might not know, is a super important state politically. Um, and this isn't a political talk, uh, but there is an executive order that just came out. Um, along with the 18,000 number, they said that states and mayors uh, now have to agree in order for refugees to be resettled in any given state. So for example, if the governor of Texas, and this is about to happen, says that Texas won't take any refugees, no refugees can go to Texas. That includes thousands of people in Texas who are waiting for their family members to join them there, right? And then also, even if the governor says yes, it's possible that a local mayor could say no. So while refugees used to be mostly a federal issue, right now there's a very localized advocacy campaign that needs to take place trying to ensure that governors of states and mayors of large popular localities agree that refugees can be admitted. Um, so make a bunch of phone calls. Um, I guarantee you that not that many people are calling the governor of Ohio on this issue and your call will make a difference. If you call your reps, that will also make a difference. Um, I think also you can volunteer. Um, there's an amazing organization that we've actually worked with on a lawsuit to, another thing is that the administration tried to shut the refugee program. Um, for people from 11 predominantly Muslim countries, and we want a lawsuit saying that they couldn't do that. Um, we did that in partnership with Community Refugee and Immigration Services here in Columbus. Um, <laughs> there are many, many volunteer opportunities ranging from just like babysitting while people do groceries or hunt for work, um, to helping people review their resumes, teaching English as a second language. We did some, uh, some volunteering originally in New Haven when we first started this, and we, uh, the overwhelming sort of critical mass of things that families wanted from us was to teach their kids how to ice skate, um, which I'm from California and was utterly incapable of doing. But this sort of again gets back to like, there's a lot of things you can do that can be helpful. Um, call the local resettlement agency and ask what that is. Um, you can set a Google News Alert, uh, not to plug Google, but I think with all the onslaught of craziness happening all the time, it's very difficult for any one issue to have much salience, I think, in the media over time. And it's easy to forget that this is a problem. Um, so I have Google News Alerts set for uh, really a bunch of things. Uh, but whatever sort of aspect of the refugee issue you care about, whether it's the US's role, whether it's refugees from a particular country or um, refugees who are you know, a specific gender identity or sexual orientation, like whatever part of this you care about, set a Google alert for it so that you get a daily reminder that it still exists and it's still happening even when it can't make the front page or even page like A30 of the major papers. You can write op-eds. Um, local papers really love to hear from local people about things they care about. You could say, you know, I care about refugees for this reason. I don't think the governor of Ohio should ban refugees for this reason. An op-ed's pretty straightforward. It's just 600 to 800 words, right? Spell check it. Uh, and finally, you should vote. Um, I'm not going to tell you which way to vote, but please, for the love of God, actually vote. 
especially young people, um, because you, I think, have a better perspective on what globalization looks like and how it's important. And if you don't exercise that knowledge at the ballot box, we're all going to suffer for it. So please, people in Ohio, <laughs> go vote. Here's why I have hope. When I, I didn't get to JFK, so JFK is the airport in New York. I didn't get there until like noon on Saturday. So it was, you know, 18 hours or something um, after the ban had been in effect. And I had no idea that there were protests. Um, I had been just like so deep in the weeds of this lawsuit and trying to like organize lawyers and so on that when I got to JFK and there were thousands of people there, like my first reaction was to freak out. Um, and also because I had forgotten a jacket and I was wearing like a hoodie. So there's, there's this press conference I gave with two Congress people and they're like in suits and I'm literally wearing ripped jeans and a hoodie and it's January 28th and freezing and I um, don't look great. Uh, but I got there and I was like, where did all these people come from? And I get out of the taxi and they're like yelling something and it turns out that what they're yelling is, let them in, let them in. And I want to clarify that the lawsuit that we filed originally that Friday night, it didn't say that the travel ban was unconstitutional. It wasn't attacking the ban itself. It was just saying you can't detain people under this, right? The way that the first version of the Muslim ban ultimately went away was that the administration just pulled it back. There was no court order to do so. Congress obviously didn't act because they don't do that anymore. The administration just saw this sort of massive show of resistance from the American people and freaked out and pulled it back. Arguably, a similar thing happened with the child separation policy. As we've discovered, there are still many elements of the child separation policy that are being undertaken, but the main thrust of it, after three or four weeks of just wild media exposure, Americans showing up to the border and saying, this is not American. This does not reflect American values and we as an American people won't stand for this, again, the administration pulled back the policy itself. It, it wasn't ordered to by a court and Congress didn't get involved. But I think that the existence of that kind of popular empathy and rage and activism and the fact that it can still make a difference even in this completely upside down universe that we exist in gives me a lot of hope. Um, I'm Jewish. Uh, mostly, and um, I think a lot about sort of my own family and whether they would have gotten here or not, and I especially think about um, what an accident citizenship is, right? Like, I was born in Berkeley, California in 1981, um, and so being Jewish was not a thing. Uh, I could have just as easily have been born in Warsaw in 1928. Um, and I think all the time about how I did nothing to deserve being born in the time and place that I was. Um, and that in citizenship and refugees, it's the same thing. No one picked to be born in Syria in the year 2000. Most of them don't even want to leave Syria. Their family has been there for thousands of years. It's their home. They love it. In the words of the British Somali poet Warsan Shira, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. No one puts their child in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. This year in particular is the 75th anniversary of the journey of a ship called the St. Louis. Who's heard of the St. Louis? It was a boat carrying about 9,000 Jews trying to, I might have that number wrong. One time I said this in a speech and then I got a really angry email about how it was wrong and then I fact check it, but I didn't write the stat down. I just wrote St. Louis story because um, <laughs> that's how I roll. Uh, but it, thousands and thousands of Jews trying to escape Nazi occupied Europe. The ship came to the US, no port would let it dock. Um, they actually had, I found this out while I was fact checking the story after receiving the angry email, um, it turns out that Roosevelt sent Coast Guard ships to patrol the boat because they were worried that the captain would deliberately run the boat aground so that people who could claim asylum, people who on the boat could claim asylum. So the Coast Guard surrounded the boat to make sure it stayed in deep enough water that it couldn't actually dock. Eventually, after having tried to land throughout the east coast of the US and in Cuba, and unable to, the boat returned to Europe and the vast majority of the people on the boat ended up in camps and about a third of them were killed. I think about that and I think about airport weekend and I think what if at every port the St. Louis tried to stop at, 4,000 Americans showed up and stood there chanting, let them in, let them in. 
history might have been a little bit different. And so the thing that gives me hope is first that it's not World War II anymore, but also that you know, 75 years later, there's a different mood in the country. And that when it did come time to clamp down on people because of their religion, to try to imprison them in airports, to try to discriminate against them, even though we lost at the Supreme Court, the majority of Americans showed up at the airports and said, this is not okay. And so in closing, I would just urge you in a completely neutral and nonpartisan way <laughs> that if the opportunity for you arises, please stand up and show up and say, let them in. <laughs>